So tonight's program, this is an MSU's Now program. We began this program. We began this program uh, at the beginning of COVID. And it was a way for us to let the people know, let the patients know what was happening with COVID and multiple sclerosis. And so for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and I am president and founder of MS Views and News. And uh, goes back a long time. If you want to know more about me, if you've never been on our program, then just, you know, write to me. You've got my email. Everybody gets email from me all the time. So just write to me and you can learn more about my multiple sclerosis. So tonight's program, we are sponsored by, so everybody could see who we're sponsored by. And obviously we're doing a great job because this list just seems to grow. I remember when it was one or two and, you know, you see what's in front of us right now. Okay. So our presenter tonight, as I had mentioned, is Dr. Subay. And Dr. Subay is the medical director of the Multiple Sclerosis Program at Memorial Healthcare Systems of South Florida. He's ba actually based out of Hollywood, Florida. And tonight he'll be speaking about our program. We have a special program today. It's understanding treatment options, the future of the MS landscape, uh, you know, different drugs that are coming out that are, um, that are, that are soon to be coming, hopefully. Biosimilars you're going to hear a little bit about. And also, Dr. Subay is not just a neurologist, but he's a neuro-ophthalmologist. And so he's going to speak with you about visual issues as well. And then we will do Q&A. Take it Thanks, away. Stuart. All right. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our program. So today I'm going to be talking about understanding treatment options, the future of MS landscape, and vision and MS. So we've got three important uh, big topics here. Uh, my one disclosure is going to be that uh, usually I go with uh, generic brands uh, for drugs, uh, but in this case, because it's a patient program, so I'm going to be using uh, brand names. All right, so the first part that we're going to be talking about is treatment options for MS. And, you know, before you talk about treatment options, you always have to start with defining MS and what the disease is, because you have to sort of lay the foundation for the talk. So we all know that MS is an autoimmune inflammatory disorder of the central nervous system, meaning brain and spinal cord, as you can see in the image. Um, uh, it, it is inflammatory. There's, there's uh, white cells and inflammatory cells that are usually in the periphery, meaning the bloodstream, and then they enter the, the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and they cause uh, damage and attacks, uh, depending on where they, they uh, uh, are present within the central nervous system. All right, so, you know, in a typical course, so patients may develop uh, relapses and, and get clinical attacks, but at the same time, on MRI, we see changes that happen over time. So as you can see in the image here, uh, the, the initial MRI on the left-hand side shows you a single lesion that's periventricular, and then on a follow-up image, you see multiple more lesions that have developed within the brain. And next, I'm going to show you a couple more images. So here you can see, uh, again, an initial MRI on the left-hand side, and then a subsequent MRI that has shown you more lesions. And on the following image, I'm going to show you more lesions that have developed and in addition to that, you can see on the right-hand side, there's a contrast MRI that shows an enhancement. The enhancement with contrast means that this lesion is newer than other lesions that have developed and have not shown on contrast. And so using contrast with MRI helps us distinguish what lesions are new and what lesions are old. And so this pattern of lesions that develop over time, that's typically what we see with multiple sclerosis. So symptoms of MS, you know, if you look it up online, and certainly you're going to see a lot of symptoms, and this list is not a short list either. Uh, so you have your common ones like fatigue, cognitive issues, uh, depression, mood changes. Uh, numbness tingling can certainly happen, weakness, pain. Uh, then you have uh, vertigo, double vision, vision loss. We're going to be talking about some of that in, later on in the presentation. Uh, gait problems, spasticity, bowel, bladder, and, and sexual dysfunction. But then you have less common symptoms, which can happen in MS, although not often. So even though I've mentioned symptoms in MS, uh, you know, there, there's a certain characteristic to how symptoms develop in most patients. Uh, and so a typical MS relapse means that, you know, symptoms slowly develop over several days. So we call that subacute. So subacute worsening of symptoms that happens over several days. And as you can see in the chart here where the curve is slowly going upwards over several days and then you get a peak where symptoms are at their worst 
and that's usually about you know a week or, or or two weeks into it and then that's when you know patients will you know you see a new lesion on the mri the patient has developed a weakness in the leg for example then they get iv steroids for example in the hospital and then slowly over days to weeks the symptoms will improve and they may come back to baseline which is where the patient was at before the relapse happened or uh, unfortunately, the recovery may not necessarily be complete and they may be left with a deficit. And even though I'm showing you this over two weeks, you know, uh, relapses can last up to six months, up to a year sometimes, depending on the severity of the attack. So this is just the, the, what I'm trying to show you here is the time frame that this is not something rapid like a stroke where things develop all of a sudden. This is a subacute onset where it's slow over several days and then it takes several days to weeks for it to resolve. This is what we call a relapse, obviously in the absence of an infection or some un other cause that would explain the, the, the deficit. So now what happens over the course of years uh, uh, with patients? So if we click once, we're gonna show you uh, that that relapse that I had shown, patients can develop multiple relapses over the course of years. Initially in the beginning of the course, patients may have more frequent relapses, and then later on, they become less and less. Uh, and then at some point in the, in the future, uh, patients really don't have much in the way of relapses. And we're gonna show you here that there is a progression that can happen over the course of MS since onset, sometimes it's very subtle to pick up, uh, but then it picks up uh, about 15 years into the diagnosis, uh, and then it can, can sort of increase, and then at some, point it'll plateau and become less obvious but that's typically what we see with most patients is having an initial relapsing course and then at some point the progression starts to become more apparent even though it's present from the beginning uh, oftentimes so i'm going to show you here and this is what mris would look like over the course if the disease is untreated and so you can see initially that there's a couple of lesions on the mri then you develop a little bit more a little bit more until you know the the lesion burden becomes too much and so we take all of these into consideration when we're thinking about treatment for ms patients in terms of how has the patient's course has been how many relapses they've had how much in the way of progression they've developed and then uh, what has their mri looked like over the past several years or since uh, since onset so the treatment strategy there's different buckets that I think about when I'm treating patients, and this is very important for everyone to understand. And so a patient may develop a relapse, and so you would certainly want to treat that relapse when it happens, and you can do that with steroids, plasma exchange, IVIG, depending on the severity of the relapse. And then if we click again, you're gonna see that there's a disease-modifying therapy that has started. That disease-modifying therapy is supposed to change the immune uh, immune system so that we can uh, change the course of MS, and I'll talk more about that. Then another click. Then you have your chronic symptomatic therapies, and so those are medications that would treat symptoms. For example, if someone has tingling, you would put them on a nerve pain medication. If someone has mood changes, you would put them potentially on an antidepressant, so on and so forth. And so these are symptomatic therapies. And so a patient may at the same time be on different treatments and each one is targeting ms in a different way and now what you see is that throughout the course of you know a, a, a patient's lifetime they may have several relapses that need to be treated they might be on a single disease modifying therapy it may be changed in the future but it's always one it's never more than one and then a patient may be on multiple symptomatic treatments depending on their need and what symptoms they have so, so those are the three different things that I think about when I'm managing patients. And it's very important to understand the role of each one because it, it, you know, we have to set the right expectation both on the physician's end and on the patient's end. All right, so now we're back to that course that I had described earlier. And so it's very important to understand when we're using disease modifying therapy, that's different from the symptomatic therapy. So why do we need different ones? Because disease modifying therapies have very specific roles. And so the first role is decreasing the relapse rate, as you can see here. And so on the prior slide, I had shown you that there are multiple relapses that happen. And so our hope is that with starting a disease modifying therapy, you like, for example, this person had two relapses and they would not have any other relapse moving forward. 
So that's the ultimate goal. And that's decreasing the lesion development on MRI. And so that same MRI image that you would see before, it would not change uh, over through the course of the, of the patient's lifetime. And so we don't want to count any more lesions than we are counting at that moment. And then the third one would be is slowing down progression. So that trajectory of where someone potentially would, would go is we would change the course and lessen the degree of uh, progression. Now, you have to uh, uh, sort of listen closely to the words that I'm using, and that is decrease progression or lessen progression, not eliminate progression. As much as we would all love for that to happen, I don't think we are there yet, and hopefully one day we will be, but at this point, we have strong enough disease-modifying therapy that's able to slow down progression. Um, which is which is a good achievement, you know, for for what we've done over the past several years. All right, so here's the current landscape with all the MS disease modifying therapy, and you know, I, I just want to take a moment to just say how impressive uh, uh, of of a treatment landscape we have right now, because just about ten years ago, maybe we had half of them, if not less, uh, and so. Uh, the the development has really uh, been impressive over the past several years, and it's great to be to to treat patients at an era where we have treatment options and we have things that we can put patients on. And so, uh, just to go over these broad categories, and and I I sort of lumped the different medications into different classes, uh, just to sort of show you this is how I think about them in my head. And so you have your glutirmer based compounds. So th those are like your copaxone, glatopa. And then you have glutirmer acetate, which is a biosimilar to the others, like a generic. Uh, you have the interferons, which are, you know, your Avenex, Rebif, Plegridi, beta seron, and Extavia. Uh, you have your S1P receptor modulators, and those are your Gelenia, Mazent, Ponvori, Zaposia. Uh, you have your fumarates, uh, the uh, Tecfidera, or the biosimilar to that, or a generic is, is dimethyl fumarate. Then you have Baffertam and Vumerity. And then you have your B cell depleters, which are Ocrevus, Rituximab, and Kesimpta. Rituximab is off-label. It is not FDA approved for MS, although we often use it uh, in patients who have MS. And then I grayed out Ublituximab because that's an upcoming treatment that I'll be mentioning towards the end of the talk. Uh, and then there are some medications that sort of don't go specifically into one of those categories, but you know they're equally important. And so Lemtrada, Obagio, Tysabri, and Mavenclad uh, are your other ones. And so this is a very impressive landscape of medications. And each one of these medication is important uh, in treating uh, a patient. And it's all about figuring out the right medicine for the right patient. So I'm going to go through these different classes uh, as a whole. And I'll try to talk about, you know, quick pros and cons about them, although uh, what I won't be mentioning is I won't be mentioning anything about efficacy uh, because I leave that up to the neurologist's judgment. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, the, the injectables, what we classically think about in terms of injectables are your interferons and glutirmer, and those have been around since the 90s and early two, 2000s. Um, you know, the, 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 the strength of the disease-modifying therapy just depends on how much of an effect that medication has on the immune system. And so uh, in its modest forms, you know, you sort of shift the balance of the immune system and it's, in its most aggressive form, you completely eliminate the immune cells uh, from the system. And so uh, interferons and glutirimer, they sort of affect that balance. Uh, and so they shift it from more of an anti-inflammatory profile uh, from it than a uh, pro-inflammatory profile. And these medications are injectables that you would, you know, inject uh, once a week, uh, three times a week, or, uh, or or every two weeks, just depends on the medication. The fumarates, the fumarates are oral medications, um, so I mentioned them previously, and those also shift the immune uh, system from a uh, pro-inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory profile. In addition to that, they actually do that to the extent that you can develop a decrease in white cell count. Uh, and so that's something that we would have to monitor uh, in patients. So, but uh, fumarates are oral and they are taken twice daily. Uh, some of them are one pill twice a day and some of them are two pills twice a day. Uh, the dosing is the same and there's some differences between them. Um, you know, depending on whether you take it with food or without food, or you need to pay attention to that or not. 
You know, one comment about biosimilars, as I mentioned, with uh, the glutirimer group and the uh, uh, the dimethylfumarate group, is you know biosimilars are they are FDA approved medications, and they are meant to match the biologic profile of the uh, previous FDA approved medication. And so, uh, uh, what's different from a generic is the fact that these are complex molecules that uh, <coughs> need to be proven in clinical studies to be exactly identical to the original molecule. And so uh, the benefit of having a biosimilar is the fact that you you know improve patient access because you have more affordable versions that you can come up with and uh, you sort of decrease the burden on the overall health system uh, and then uh, you lower the cost obviously which is important uh, as we all know you know disease modifying therapies can be very expensive. So moving on to S1P receptor modulators, these are medications that will take white cells or lymphocytes and they will trap them in lymph nodes so they can't escape. Uh, the original drug that came out was the Jelenia, the non-selective agent, and then there are three more refined or selective agents that have been developed, Mazent, Zbosia, and Ponvori. And um, uh, we also believe that some of them have the ability to to enter the central nervous system, the brain, and have an effect there, uh, possibly on slowing down progression or decreasing uh, uh, brain volume shrinkage or atrophy. Uh, as a class, the original one uh, uh, had uh, some uh, concerns with cardiac conduction abnormalities, and so you had to do a first dose observation where you watch someone take the medication, you watch their vital signs for six hours afterwards. Now, with the development of the selective agents, that effect seems to be lessened and so you can do that observation or if someone does not have any cardiac risk factors you can just start them on a low dose of the medicine and titrate them up slowly and they're fairly well tolerated and they're all once daily oral medications so we have uh, several drugs that we're going to talk here and so our b-cell depleters i mentioned that originally rituximab uh, was used in MS, it is off-label. Uh, and so once we found out that rituximab showed some promise in working on MS, and so then we've developed Ocrevus and Kesimpta. So those are other B-cell depleters. Uh, Ocrevus is an IV medication that would be infused every six months uh, on a maintenance uh, level. And then Kesimpta is a monthly injection that would also similarly deplete B-cells uh, although it's administered monthly as an injectable. Uh, and then I grayed out ublituximab because uh, that's the next uh, B-cell depleter which should be uh, arriving soon on the market. Uh, we have our non-selective depleters, meaning that those are depleting B and T cells, not just B cells. And so you have Lemtrada, uh, which is an IV treatment that patients would receive uh, for five days in the first year three days in the second year, and then they have to be monitored for a total of four days after the last infusion that they have had. So, um, uh, and it would deplete both B and T cells and then they repopulate. Uh, Mavenclad also depletes uh, uh, lymphocytes, B and T cells, and so it would do that uh, uh, through uh, programmed cell death. And so it sort of sends a signal to the cells uh, to sort of slowly die off, and, and it would do that slowly over time. So you would do, it's uh, it's an oral drug that's weight-based, and so it's five days in one month, and five days in the next month, and then nothing for a full year, and then five days in five days. How many pills a patient takes within those five days depends on their weight. Um, and so, uh, so uh, that's another way of sort of uh, uh, attacking the immune system. So we have some other mechanisms that we sort of mentioned and didn't fall into like a specific category. And so Tysabri, uh, Tysabri is an IV medication that patients would receive every four to six weeks. And uh, Tysabri has a very novel uh, uh, mechanism of action because it seals the blood-brain barrier uh, and so that all the cells that are active in the bloodstream, they're not able to enter the central nervous system or the brain. Uh, so it's a very unique way of controlling MS. And Obagio uh, is a pill that's taken once a day, and it it decreases the, um, I guess to put it in, in uh, terms, it decreases the, the, the growth and development of lymphocytes. 
And so it shuts off the signal that will, will make these active cells grow more. Uh, so that's how it would work. And it is once daily. So we have to go back now and remember what the goal of the disease modifying therapies are. And so we mentioned that all of these medications, regardless of which one it is, we're trying to decrease the relapse rate, decrease the lesion development on MRI, and slow down the progression as much as we can. And you know, sometimes we're able to, to clearly see those goals being achieved, and sometimes it's sort of hard to say whether a medication is achieving those goals or not. Uh, but we try to do a lot of assessments uh, in practice, in clinical practice, so that we're able to get a sense of how the patient is doing with regards to achieving those goals. So if you notice, what I didn't mention is changing symptoms, improving symptoms, uh, because you know those are not things that directly are tackled by the medications. Uh, if someone has had a recent relapse, and so starting a disease-modifying therapy quickly might help the repair mechanism to kick in and for them to have their symptoms improved. Uh, but symptoms that are chronic, and so it's unlikely that it would be changed with these disease-modifying therapies. And I'll give two examples. And so I've had this in, in practice where patients tell me that, oh, doctor, you know, if I miss one dose of my pill that they take twice a day, uh, then I start to feel my symptoms are worse. And then, you know, I, I, I take it and, and I feel much better. So that sort of doesn't make sense because we don't expect these modifying therapies to change symptoms, especially that quickly. And, uh, you know, and then you have patients who, you know, will tell me that, oh, doctor, you know, as soon as you prescribe this medication and I took it, my symptoms went away completely. So that's another one that, you know, I'm glad it did, but I don't think that these modifying therapies uh, change uh, symptoms, and especially in the way that the patient's uh, describing. So, um, so we really have to to be on the same page in terms of the expectation of what a DMT should be doing. All right. So I sort of mentioned this, the knots, and so we can uh, show those also. So we said improving or alleviating symptoms, repairing damage. So that's an important concept here. And so, unfortunately, we still don't have the repair mechanism. Uh, and we don't have the repair medication that's going to reverse whatever it is uh, damage that has happened in terms of lesions, in terms of disability that has developed. Uh, you know, I, I put in the asterisk next to uh, reversing disability, and that's because if a disability had happened rapidly, let's just say that someone developed an acute relapse where both legs became weak, they got admitted to the hospital, they're getting their IV steroids, so that's a rapid disability. That's not a long-term progression one. And so if you are starting someone on disease-modifying therapy quickly, then potentially you can improve that disability as opposed to it remaining the same or slightly improving. Uh, but in general, that chronic disability that patients develop, uh, medications are not able to do that. So we have to consider a few things when we're choosing disease-modifying therapy because I mentioned uh, you know, m many medications that we have on the market right now. And so what do we use to sort of pick this versus that? Um, and so here they are. Let's, let's see. The degree of disease activity. So again, you need to know is how many relapses the patient has had, what their MRIs have looked like, how much activity there is, what their disability progression has been. That's going to tell you the level of strength that you need to, to pick in terms of the medication. The patient's clinical course, the same thing. And so if let's just say that this is someone who has had MS for 20 years and they may have had a, a lot of activity initially with relapses, uh, changes on the MRI, but then over the past five years or 10 years, their MRIs really haven't changed much. And uh, they've not really had a lot of activity, but it's more of like a slow decline or progression. That's a different conversation as opposed to someone who you know, was just admitted two weeks ago to the hospital and a few months ago had another relapse and last year they had another. So you got to understand where the patient is in their clinical course. Comorbidities and concurrent medications. This is very important. So I mentioned an example. And so if you're going to start, if you have someone who's on an S1P receptor modulator like um, uh, Jelenia, for example, and so if they have uh, diabetes or cardiac uh, conduction problems, heart block, you probably don't want to consider that medication. If someone has um, uh, 
IBS with an upset stomach, you probably don't want to put them on a fumarate, uh, so on and so forth. And you have medications that can interact with each other. And so there are some disease modifying therapies that uh, will interact with other medications and vice versa. And so we really need to, to take into account other medical problems that the patients have. Prior infectious exposures. And so every patient that comes to our practice, and so immediately we want to test for a whole bunch of things that they've been exposed to. And that's going to help us determine what medication we're able to put them at. So for example, you have medications that increase the risk of herpetic infections. And so you got to make sure that they've been uh, immune to uh, varicella or they've been vaccinated. Um, you have a medication that can increase the risk of PML, which is a, a fatal brain infection. And so you want to, you, you know, you need to know what their JC virus is like. Uh, there are some medications that can reactivate hepatitis or tuberculosis. So you got to know these things uh, when you're considering medications. And then this is a very, very important concept. And so it's, you know, the patient's adherence and reliability. And so there are times when, you know, I have this great medication that I can put someone on, but this medication requires some very strict monitoring that we have to do. And if I get patients who, you know, you ask them to get their blood drawn and they don't get their blood drawn, or you ask them for MRIs and they don't get their MRIs, or they need to be seen in the clinic and they don't come back for follow-up. And so this is a risk, you know, you can't put people on aggressive medications and not have them adhere to the medications uh, protocol. And so I've actually de-escalated patients from, you know, stronger medications to milder ones because of that risk. And so, you know, safety is the most important thing and our patient safety is the most important. And so, uh, you know, you can put people on less aggressive medications that don't require a lot of monitoring. And then that way, if they're not able to get the testing done, um, then, then, you know, uh, at least they're on a medication that, you know, can cover them. And so this is this conversation is very important nowadays, and that's the risk of infections and vaccination status, especially, you know, now we're two years into COVID. Um, and so uh, we've all heard of stories of patients developing COVID who have MS or on disease modifying therapy. There are certain medications that lower the immune system and increase the risk of uh, not just COVID, other infections. I get patients who have frequent UTIs or frequent upper respiratory infections. So um, it is important to take those into consideration. And at the same time, vaccination status, because there are certain disease modifying therapies that decrease the response to vaccines. And so if this is someone who's unvaccinated, who needs to be vaccinated, then, you know, if you put them on a medication, that's going to reduce their response to the vaccination. So you have to keep that in, uh, into consideration. And above all, you know, finally, it, it's it, it's the patient's preference and the patient's prior experiences. And so patients will ultimately tell me that, you know, I feel comfortable with this. I feel comfortable with that. I like this. I, I, I don't like that. Or I heard this person had this or this person had that. And so, you know, we, we always have to listen to our patients and take that into consideration. And, um, you know, when patients ask me, well, what do you think, doctor? You're the doctor. I want you to make a decision. And so, you know, I, I tend to be somewhere in the middle because you have to guide patients. And so you have to give them, what I tell them is that I'm, I'm typically not biased towards a certain medication brand or class. And I'll say, you know, I think you should be somewhere here and I'll give three or four medications as an option. And I'll say, depends on now what your lifestyle is like and what you're comfortable with or what you've heard, we can sort of narrow it down further. So there always has to be that shared decision-making. Uh, but, you know, with, with guidance from the physician. So that's what we try to do. All right. So now we talked about the current. What about the future? So what's happening? So let's see what we have. So ublituximab, I've mentioned a few times now. And so it's an upcoming B cell depleter. And it works uh, in, the, in a similar fashion to how ocrelizumab and of, um, ocrevus and, and um, kesimpta work. Uh, except just on a different part of that receptor. And um, it's an IV medication, that same thing, and so the patients would get it on day one, uh, two weeks later, and then every six months. Uh, uh, it is a one-hour infusion, uh, maintenance infusion, so it is a short infusion that patients would get. And I believe that we should be seeing it uh, uh, come very soon in the coming uh, months. 
So this is a very exciting class of medications, the BTK inhibitors. So Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, this is a class of medications that instead of killing off B cells, why not just decrease their activity? And so you inhibit them from growing, proliferating, maturing, and differentiating. So you know you're 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 sort of modulating those B cells. And um, the early studies for some of these medications have shown promise in terms of you know great efficacy. Um, and we have uh, five potential BTK inhibitors that are coming to the market: uh, evobrutinib, tolibrutinib, fenibrutinib, remibrutinib, and orlibrutinib. And all five of these are currently in, in clinical trials. And so odds are is that your MS neurologist already has one that's uh, already has a trial and they're enrolling patients for it. Um, uh, one of these medications, uh, the studies are on hold for uh, 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 further data collection and safety concerns, uh, but the other ones are active. And what's exciting is the fact that these medications are not only being tested in relapsing MS, but they're also being tested in secondary progressive and primary progressive MS. And so we're very excited and looking forward to the results of these trials. Now, keep in mind is, while the other medication that I mentioned is gonna be coming to the market in a few months, we're gonna need to wait a, quite a bit for these BTK inhibitors. I, you know, I, I would say you might wanna wait about five years or, so, or, or more uh, before we really start to see them on the market. Um, but it is an exciting class of medications. There's also promise that they work within the central nervous system, and so they might be able to slow down progression, uh, but you know, we need to wait for the tr uh, further phase three trial data to, to uh, show us that level of activity. So this is another molecule that I found. Um, uh, exasomib, and uh, it's a it's a current treatment uh, for cancer, and um, it inhibits plasma cells. Pl plasma cells are what B cells become once they fully mature, and they are certainly a source of uh, inflammation within MS. And and so um, this study is based in the UK, and it's a phase one study, so it's very early, uh, uh, a very early study, but it's looking at relapsing in progressive MS, and it's looking into clearing out those oligoclonal bands and spinal fluid in patients with MS. You know, I know that everyone is curious about remyelination as I am, and every once in a while, you know, we'll, we'll sort of review what re, uh, studies uh, have been, you know, developed on remyelination. Remyelination, which is the repair of myelin that's damaged uh, by MS. Uh, and so we have multiple studies that have been attempted uh, you know, some some on stem cells, uh, biotin, cl clemastine, metformin, opacinumab. Um, uh, there's a gold. Uh, um, there's some other molecules, domperidone, quetiapine, and testosterone. Some of them are ongoing. Some of them have failed. And so we still don't have a study that really has shown great efficacy. And even for the stem cells, I know that's going to come up. And so we don't have good data to show that stem cells actually slow down progressive MS. Uh, right now, its uh, its best efficacy is at highly active relapsing MS. And so if we click, um, we're going to go over some issues with remyelination studies. So the issues to consider is, you know, remyelination is more likely to work in the acute phase than it is in the chronic. And so remember that that's uh, what I, the example that I gave about someone who has developed a relapse acutely and um, and they were treated in the hospital with IV steroids, they were started on a disease modifying therapy and then they uh, recovered. And so, uh, you know, the, the earlier you are into an attack, the, the better chance you have at remyelination to happen. And so those studies that are looking into patients that have had chronic disabilities, you know, remyelination becomes very difficult. In fact, many of those studies that are on remyelination, uh, what they're recruiting is recruiting patients who have had relapses, for example, optoneuritis being something that's easier to study. Uh, you know, the other issue with remyelination studies is in order to determine, you know, the impact of chronic lesions is you got to follow these patients for a long time. And, you know, most clinical trials, they're two years in duration. And then maybe you have an extension for another five years or so. 
um, and, and the clinical trials are very expensive. So to be able to, to do a longitudinal study to look into remyelination in the chronic state, it's, it's, uh, it's not something that's e easily done. And then, you know, another challenge is what is the best outcome measure to tell if remyelination actually happened? You know, you, you, you design studies, you know, when we design studies, phase three trials to get MS medications approved on the market, we're using relapse rates, how many relapses patients have had, how many lesions they developed on MRI, uh, what their progression is like. Those are things that you can easily measure in a study. So then you're able to prove that this medication actually worked. Now, if we're gonna design a, a, a trial that's gonna look into remyelination, what measure are you going to use to prove that this actually happened? So as an example, when opisunumab was tested in acute optic neuritis, they used uh, uh, the visual evoked potentials to show that, okay, the, the evoked potential shows how long it takes for the conduction to go from the back of the head to the eye. And so they measure that signal and they were able to prove that, okay, the, the duration was shorter Aha, so that means that we were able to prove that, that there's more rewiring that has happened. So we were able to prove that. But then to try to show it on a, on a measure where you're measuring a uh, number of lesions or you're measuring the uh, number of fibers uh, in a certain nerve, you're not getting the same result. And so part of it is we need a good outcome measure for remyelination and we're not completely there yet. And so we have multiple challenges but we continue to try and look into uh, possible treatments that can help with remyelination. All right, and then the, the last part of my talk for this evening is gonna be about vision and MS. And so, you know, this is a, a cartoon that's showing you the eyeball uh, with the left side showing you the cornea, the lens, and then the back part of the eye, which is the retina, the orange part, uh, and then the optic nerve, which you can see sticking out in the bottom right-hand side, and that's what then connects to the brain. And you can see here that light enters the eye and then it hits the retina, and that's how we perceive vision. So patients who have optic neuritis, uh, uh, what, what they may develop is if you click once, then you'll see blurring of the central vision or part of the vision, and so that's you know, this is me trying to emulate what optic neuritis would look like to many patients. And so it would be like looking through a fishbowl, something that's just not clear. Uh, and sometimes it could be severe enough where it's just dark or white. And so when you have inflammation to the optic nerve, demyelination that happens, it depends. So if the demyelination is behind the eye, then what you typically see when you look at the optic nerve and you're gonna see a healthy optic nerve because the damage is happening behind the eye. You're not seeing it. If the demyelination tends, happens you know, right where that nerve connects with the eyeball, so then this image would show up. And you can see that the, the nerve looks angry, inflamed, and it has some uh, edema in, in, in blood. So one of the things that you wanna do is you know, assess the patient's uh, visual acuity and, and how far down the chart they, they're able to see. So then we also you know, check the color vision because that's another indicator that someone has lost vision from optic neuritis. And you know, we can also see that they, uh, they can lose vision within their visual field. And so the visual field is how far out someone is able to see and uh, they can lose a, a, a portion of their visual field. And, and we can use a machine like this called a Humphrey visual field that can test the patient's visual field. So here's a case of optic neuritis. We can see that this person's visual acuity was normal in the right eye, 2020, but it uh, worsened in the left eye, 2040, and they lost color vision in the left eye. So they're, they're able, only able to see one out of 10 plates of color, and there's their visual field defect also. So this is gonna show you how the response to light is gonna differ uh, between the right and left eye. And so you can see here that the right eye uh, looks fairly small, the, the pupil size looks fairly small. And now when it shifts over to the other eye, and so you can see that the pupil is larger because that eye doesn't receive light the same way that the other one does. And there it is on the MRI. So you can see that that optic nerve on the left-hand side is inflamed mm -hmm. as opposed to the opposite eye. And here you can also see it on a coronal section, which is the patient looking at us. And you can see how that nerve is lighting up, whereas on the opposite side, the nerve doesn't light up. 
So there are other vision problems that can develop in MS. And, and so the optic neuritis happens in the mechanism where we perceive light and we see. But you can also have a problem with eye movements. And so you have uh, three cranial nerves that control the eye movements, three, four, and six. So cranial nerve six is the nerve that will pull out the eye on either side. The fourth nerve is what's going to tilt the eye looking down and out on either eye. And then you have the third nerve that's going to control the rest of the eye movements. And so that would be looking up, looking down, looking inwards, um, or it'll even affect the pupil and it'll control the contraction of the pupil. So patients, MS patients who develop a problem with the mechanism of eye movements, and so instead of losing vision, they have double vision. And this is what it would look like. And now you can see how that image looks blur blurry because the images have separated and each eye is seeing something different because the alignment of the eyes is not the same. So what if a patient had blurred vision? What should they do? The first thing is that you should figure out which eye the problem is in. So if you're having a problem on this side of the vision, don't assume that it's the right eye because this is where it is. Because sometimes it could be a problem in, in both eyes. And so you want to do this, you want to do that, and compare, okay, is it this eye or this eye? And you figure out. And so sometimes it can be fine unless you have both eyes open. But if you cover either eye, then things are fine. That's important too. So any kind of feedback that you can give to the physician from that perspective would be helpful. The next thing is that, is it constant or is it intermittent? That makes a difference. And so did it just start and it continued to be present or it's off and on, off and on that's happening repeatedly throughout the day? And then obviously, you know, when did it start? Was it in the morning, nighttime? What were you doing when you noticed it? That's also helpful. And whether there's any pain in the eye, that would also give us some information because oftentimes optic neuritis uh, has some associated pain especially when you move the eye around. All right, so let's summarize the talk. So um, we want to, you know, the bottom line is you want to understand the typical symptoms in course of MS relapses, okay? Uh, you know, we sort of showed is how relapses happen, how symptoms are, what constitutes a relapse, what doesn't. We want to understand the role of various treatments used in MS. There are some that we use for symptoms, some that we use to change the disease, some that we use in the acute setting. Everyone has its own role. We need to understand the goals of the disease-modifying therapies and what they're supposed to do, because otherwise, if we don't understand that, then we set the false expectation. We have to understand the visual symptoms in MS, whether it's the problem with the eye movements or whether it's the problem with the optic neuritis. Sometimes it's hard to sort out between the two, but, you know, uh, trying to figure out which eye is the problem is a start and that your physicians can take care of the rest. And we talked about, you know, assessing and troubleshooting visual symptoms next. I guess that's it. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very good talk. I haven't heard a talk like that in a long time. So I want to thank you for that. And I'm sure everybody does as well. We have several questions to go through and um, I'm going to start with, there's a Deborah, and by the way, everybody, I am going to announce your first name because there's more than one of you out there, um, unless it is a really quirky name, and then I won't ask, and I don't mean quirky as something bad, but something different. Okay, so Deborah asks, are there any medications for patients over 65 who have secondary progressive MS with no active lesions, just progressing in disability that you have found to be effective? Yeah, so so the one thing you know in all these programs is you know we, we have to try to make sure that that questions are very generalized and they're not specific to certain cases and so every case is different and so you you can't use blanket statements like this where over sixty five and progressive and because uh, you know every every situation is different and so even though sometimes you a medication or a treatment may not necessarily be proven that it works. That doesn't necessarily mean that we don't use it. And so what we do in clinical practice might be different than what we do in, uh, uh, than what's been proven in clinical trials. And so there are medications that have shown to work in secondary progressive MS, although active secondary progressive MS, where you have some kind of activity. Uh, so, but, but to, to, you know, sort of a blanket statement, there isn't any. Okay, thank you. Next, Laura asks, are there any treatments for primary progressive? 
Yeah, so one of the MS medications, Ocrevus, was the first medication to show that it works in primary progressive MS. It actually slowed down the progression by about 25%. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, tell me why I can safely use a generic over a brand. Because medication. it is similar to the brand medication. There is no difference on a molecular level between the two. So why is it known then that you know, people should stick to brands as much as possible and not use a generic. Often we hear. There are, all right. So there are certain medications, even outside the world of MS, where there is a difference between the generic and the brand. Um, and so uh, depending on, on what the, the medication is, is, you know, is coded with or what's put in or what, you know, inactive ingredients are in there. But in, in MS, uh, you know, generics are biosimilars. They are identical to uh brand medications. Okay, so that leads to another question. Are all generics biosimilars or in reverse? Not all, but but the ones that we have uh, right now are. Okay, all right. Now, next question from Laura is, and are there side effects from using generics? Uh, no different than side effects that would be used for brand. Okay, thank you. Next, Monique asks, I sometimes get nystagmus. Does this mean I have, I'm having a relapse even if I'm not aware of any other symptoms? Probably not. It's very unusual to have a relapse that only causes nystagmus and nothing else. It usually means that it's a manifestation of something old. Okay, thank you for that. Have you, I didn't, I didn't unfortunately hear everything. Did you discuss any heat related symptoms and how it might affect vision? We did not go over symptoms, although heat can affect symptoms in general, including vision, where it temporarily worsens the function of vision, and then you cool someone and, and the symptoms go away. Okay, thank you. Denise says, how does age affect the Ocrevus infusion? At some point, should you stop taking it? There are several clinical trials that are coming soon that are going to answer that question as to, is there a time when it is okay to stop medications? We will find out. Okay, thank you. Next, a person wants to know where you're located. Hollywood, Florida, Memorial okay. Healthcare System. Okay, thank you. Uh, do all the medications slow progression? Uh, yes, to different degrees. Okay, next, uh, next one is, with all the classes of therapy, if I'm failing one of the medications from a specific class, should I switch to another classification when changing medications? I would recommend that, although it depends on the definition of failed, but yes. Okay, so yeah, so for those that are online and may want to know right now, what I just said and about failing, can you tell them that why a person could be failed by a drug or that their own body fails the drug? Yeah, so I, I don't like to use the word fail, by the way. I don't think it's a good word. But okay. let's just say that disease activity on the medication. And so if we truly believe that this activity happened because the mechanism of how this medication works didn't align with that patient's MS, then we should switch to something completely different, works in a different way. Uh, but if there was a specific reason as to why this person you know, had activity, then maybe within the class, you can switch to another one. Okay, thank you. Kay is asking, in the past five years, oops, I don't know where her question went. I'll get back to Kay in a minute. All right, Kevin writes, that was incredible, comprehensive, incredibly comprehensive and one of the best DMT presentations I've ever seen, and the optical portion was the bomb. My MS started with optic neuritis, then uh, ABDUCENS palsy, and finally relapse remitting MS over 20 years. Great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank right, you. Back to, K. back to K. In the past five years, it seems to us that low dose naltrexone, 4.5 milligrams, is being prescribed more often for MS. How does it work? Uh, we don't know. There's no big studies that have shown low-dose naltrexone to show a decent amount of efficacy. And so 
uh, I don't have good data to support its use. Okay, thank you. Um, next person wants to know if uh, gelenia could be a cause for cancer. Uh, potentially. Talk to your physician. Okay, thank you for that. Next, we only have a few left at this point in time because you're going through these rather quickly. All right. Um, person writes, at what point in the disease process do you think gadolinium is no longer necessary with MRI? Great question. So the gadolinium helps tell us what's new and what's not. If you have a prior MRI and a time frame where you can say, okay, if something developed, I, I know that it happened between this MRI and that MRI, then you don't need the gadolinium. But if let's just say someone has not had an MRI in five, 10 years, then I want the gadolinium because if I see something, I have a long duration to compare it to. Okay, thank you. Next, is there currently any objective manner to decide what medication will be most effective for a particular patient? Uh, well, we use all of what I talked about in terms of what we think would be the appropriate medication for each patient. Okay, thank you. All right, next one is, excuse me one second, I know I have some here. Oh, person wants to know when there's going to be a cure. Someday, in my lifetime, I hope. Okay, next, flying through these, right? Everybody should be like this, sort of. All right, um, I've had vision issues for 20 years. Is there any hope it will go away or is the damage permanent? Corrected vision is 2050, corrected vision is 2050 the right eye and 2090 in the left eye with double vision? Yeah, I, you know, the, unfortunately, is, is the longer the, the deficits are, the harder it is to reverse. Although there are low vision specialists that may help with accommodations around low vision. Okay, thank you for that. Next one is what DMD is working the best for most patients in the current time? It's the one that works best for the patient. Every patient is different. Okay, next, in your opinion, how close are we to a remyelinating drug? Uh, closer than we were before, not close enough to where we're gonna see it, you know, in the coming years. Okay, and then to follow that up, is there currently any objective manner to decide what medication will be most effective for a particular patient? Did I already say that one? I think I did. You did. All right. Well, you could answer it again. Okay. It depends on the patient. You know, every patient is different. You, you just need to talk to your neurologist and figure out what's best for you. Okay. Thank you. Another, per another patient is now asking, what will you do if a patient wants to take a medication that you don't think is the best one for them? Well, it depends on the medication that they want to take. Um, that's a complicated question. It's um, always a joint decision between the patient and the physician. And, uh, you know, usually is when we make recommendations, there are specific reasons as to why we're making a recommendation. And so if the, if the patient wishes to go on something different that is clearly off of the recommendation, I certainly would make that apparent to the patient, tell them that, you're you're not thinking along the same lines that I am. Okay, thank you. So a, another patient writes that um, when taken off a specific medication was then put on to Avonex and then had side effects of headaches and doesn't know what to do now and what direction to go in, what should she do next? Talk to your neurologist. You know, so I, I think what uh, Dr. Sube is trying to say is that he doesn't have you as a patient, so he really can't answer your questions. Okay, and that was just said a little bit different. All right, Nora writes, is there any age to stop taking a DMT? We're going to hopefully have an answer to that in the coming years. Okay. My so there's three studies. Let me elaborate on that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There, there are three studies that are looking into this. One study is looking at, I think, 60 or 65 plus stop DMT and see how they do. The other study is, regardless of age, if you've had stable MS for five years, stop DMT. 
And then uh, a third one was sort of similar along that same line where regardless of ages, you know, if, if you've not had any disease activity, everything is quiet, then you stop the, the disease modifying therapy. So these are great questions because oftentimes if someone doesn't have activity, does that mean that the medicine is working or does that mean the MS is no longer inflammatory? We're going to find out. Thank you for that. All right. Next is uh, biomarkers. Other than other than getting an MRI, are there any other known biomarkers? Yes, I didn't go over that, but we hope to have uh, soon uh, 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 blood biomarkers. And so, uh, like, for example, serum neurofilament light chain. So that's a marker of nerve breakdown. And studies have clearly shown that uh, the longer MS goes on, there's more breakdown, so the level increases. So potentially we can use this blood test to figure out um, uh, how someone's MS is doing from a, you know, from a lab standpoint, although you probably will need multiple time points to be able to draw a trajectory. Okay, thank you. We're out of questions. Oh, actually a person just wrote, if you could enroll a patient in a BTK clinical trial, or a free myelination study, which would you choose? The one that the patient feels comfortable with. I think it's great the fact that you're volunteering for clinical trials. We all need to participate in clinical trials because that's how we're gonna learn about MS and understand MS better. Uh, so thank you for considering trials. Just go with the one that you feel comfortable with. All right, thank you for that. All right, and that was the last question. So I do wanna thank you. And as several patients have written that, they want to thank you for doing this talk as well. And, you know, I, I announced the one about Kevin, and uh, and that was awesome. So, you know, um, I, I just got a bunch more questions. Do you want to do these? All right. They Final all, question. They all, just, they all just popped up. Uh, well, person writes, excellent information, useful and fresh. Even though I've heard many presentations over the 20 years with MS, thank you for an articulate, visually interesting, and succinct presentation. That was good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Mad. That's from somebody named Mad Tar. And another person writes, Dr. Sube was awesome. And another person writes, what is your gut feeling about how COVID has impacted all of us in the long run? Oh, yeah, that's a loaded question. I have a lot to say about COVID. Um, but, you know, the past two couple of years have not been easy, whether it's for patients, physicians, the healthcare industry, everyone. And, um, Hopefully, though, we will move past it and we will be able to continue to treat our patients, uh, mitigating the risks and everything else related to COVID. Okay. I'm going to take one more question. And that's it, because otherwise they're going to pop in constantly. Mark is asking, what happens to a baclofen pump during an MRI? Great question. Yes, that's great. It depends on the pump's MRI compatibility because the MRI can change the programming of the pump or it can overheat a uh, pump and wire. So it just depends on the year it was uh, uh, installed and, and whether it's compatible or not. Okay. So again, thank you for presenting tonight. As you heard, people loved you. We can't wait to have you again and uh, we'll just have to come up with some new topics. Okay. Thank you everybody for joining and have a great night. We're out of here. <laughs>